Okay, great. Thank you very much, everybody, for attending. We are going to get started. I know your time is precious. I am Aaron Golding, a tax lawyer here at Roth and & Company, and I help people sleep at night. I enjoy and have a passion for uh, helping people resolve their tax problems so, in a legal manner. So what I'd like to do is speak today about the uh, impact or non-impact that COVID-19 has had on negotiating with the IRS and the tax authorities, the state tax authorities. I am going to assume for the purpose of this webinar, even though I know that there are many tax professionals on this uh, webinar, I'm going to assume that you're not, so that those people that don't necessarily understand all the acronyms will be able to follow and appreciate what we're doing. So I apologize if it's a little bit too simplistic. And um, okay, here we go. What I'd like to do is speak about how th this is the, the agenda that we're going to discuss today, which is how has COVID-19 affected debt negotiation? Everybody wants to know if they could get a deal. Even before COVID-19, everybody wanted to know, can I get a deal? Will the IRS negotiate with me? Will the state negotiate with me? And especially now during COVID-19, when the government is giving out trillions of dollars in all different kinds of programs. So uh, there are many people that have the feeling that government is giving out trillions of dollars <clears throat> like water and I'm not getting any of it. So there are people that call up and they say, what do I qualify for? PPP, unemployment, all different kinds of uh, tax credits. So what I'd like to do is address the issue of if people have tax debt, how they could resolve it, how they would resolve it in a regular time period and is there any difference in the uh, dealing with the IRS and the state during and after COVID-19? So what I'd like to do is give a, a, a basic synopsis. We're not going to get into all the details, but a basic synopsis, synopsis of what the options are to resolve tax debt. And what we're going to talk about really applies to personal tax debt or business tax debt. Uh, sometimes uh, payroll taxes, uh, it's called something, something called a trust fund, and uh, the uh, business owner can be personally liable for it. That is something which also, whatever we're talking about today will apply to those types of things also. So the it's important for us to speak about the statute of limitations, which means how long does the IRS have to collect on a debt before it expires? Because that's important to have in the back of your mind whenever you're discussing any type of resolution or negotiating with the IRS. Because sometimes it's not a good idea to give them more time to be able to collect on that. So we'll talk about that. We'll also talk about the world of penalty abatements as it uh, affects and as it applies with uh, COVID-19 issues. So we will jump right in. We're going to talk about the options to resolve tax debt. And uh, soon we're going to talk about how each of these apply differently. Uh, during COVID-19, but we're just going to go through the basic options that there are to resolve the tax debt. Uh, number one is an installment agreement, which is the way a high majority, a super majority of tax debts are dealt with, are resolved, is through an installment agreement. That's where you pay it over time. There also is an option to pay it. There are different methods to pay it, uh, but most of the people that want to get a deal. Uh, they're not interested in paying it in full, but sometimes there are ways to pay it 
to get what's called a short-term payment agreement. They don't want a lien filed or a levy. You might be able to get a little bit extra time to be able to pay it. There is something called currently non-collectible. It's a good term to know. And I would say within the past few weeks, I've gotten many calls where my answer to them was to call the IRS and try to get on this currently non-collectible list. And what that basically means is that the IRS will say, okay, I understand that you owe the taxes. However, based on your current income and expenses, you're insolvent, which means you're not making it by every month. And they have a list of certain expenses um, which they you know, will allow and qualify. So if you call the IRS and you go through your monthly income and expenses, which for many people that were laid off, don't have their businesses the way they were before, they don't have a certain amount of income, their expenses exceed their income. If their expenses, and talking about allowable expenses, uh, reasonable expenses exceed their income, the IRS will put them into something called currently non-collectible, which means the debt is still there, still accruing penalties and interest, but it is the IRS will not take any collection activity. They're not going to expect you to make payments and, uh, you know, it's just going to sit there. They, they might send you notices, but they're not going to garnish your wages or levy your bank accounts, take any money or do any type of collection activity. So that's an option for some people to, uh, to think about during this time period is to call the IRS and say, uh, can I speak to somebody? Uh, I'm going through a hardship. That's a good word to use when you're speaking to them because that's the word that they uh, use to define whether somebody should go in currently non-collectible is if they have a hardship. So say I'm in a hardship situation, I'm wondering if the IRS could place me in currently non-collectible status. There is another option which we are going to be talking about at length today, which is the offering compromise. You might hear lots of ads on the radio, TV, wherever it is, um, you know, you owe certain, do, do you owe more than $10,000 to the IRS? Uh, due to uh, special programs, you can get pennies on the dollar. So we're going to talk about, is that accurate? Is that not accurate? Uh, can you get pennies on the dollar? And how that might uh, or might not change due to COVID-19. We'll talk about that. Another option, which we're not going to talk a lot about, is the option of bankruptcy. Sometimes that's a last resort, but there are certain, as a general rule, taxes uh, are not dischargeable, which means they don't go away in bankruptcy, but taxes that are older than three years, as a general rule, do. And, you know, person should, if that might be an option, a person might speak to a person has other debts, you know, beyond their tax debt, they have credit card debts or something like that, speak to a bankruptcy attorney, because they might be able to deal with everything, including older tax debts. Okay, now we'll talk about uh, COVID-19 effects on the IRS. Now, this is a really uh, as, as we know from going through this pandemic, uh, everything, the world is moving at a rapid pace and uh, things are changing by the minute. And, you know, the most accurate answer that anybody could give you in, uh, you know, in, in the last six months is probably, I don't know. That's the most accurate answer. So there are a lot of uh, things that are changing at the IRS. So let's just talk briefly about the, um, the effects on being able to get a deal with the IRS and negotiating with the IRS uh, and the states uh, as it relates to COVID-19. So what I'd like to do is maybe uh, differentiate between two different parts to my job, to 
resolving a tax matter. There really is the science aspect and there is the art aspect. The science aspect, which is what most of the IRS is focused on, which is everything in the box, exactly you know, how it fits the form with the numbers, that usually is, um, that is the, the science. So in other words, does the person technically qualify for penalty abatement? Does he qualify for an offer and compromise? And we're gonna talk about that uh, at length in a, in a few minutes, uh, the qualifications for an offer and compromise. Those are, that's the science aspect. As a general rule, those things will not change uh, due to COVID-19. So in other words, it's not accurate to say that, well, hey, we know the government is struggling. We know the government owes tons of money. So therefore, they'd be more likely to deal to be able to get some money. So therefore, if I owe $100,000 at the end of 2019, can I just call somebody up and say, will you take 50 and agree to resolve it? The answer is no. The IRS does not have a program like that, and neither does any state that I am familiar with uh, to be able to have a program like that. That is going to be really subject to the, the science of the tax resolution. There is gonna be a program called Offer and Compromise, which we're gonna talk about that. But when you talk about the, uh, the science aspect, the numbers aspect, nothing has changed because of COVID-19. So they aren't more likely to just accept a deal. People at the IRS uh, have very clear guidelines and rules that they need to stick with. And uh, as a general rule, their main concern is to go through their cases, do their job and not get in trouble. So that's the, the basic idea when you talk about the science, the numbers of the resolving a tax matter. There also is another part of my job, which is the, a little bit more of an art rather than a science. And that's when you move from the computers and the computer-like people, the robots, to uh, the human beings. And there are certain issues when it comes to resolving a matter, and we're gonna talk more about it, when things are not so black and white, things are not so clear. It's not clear that, okay, I owe the $100,000, I just wanna get a deal and do 50. There are certain things such as penalty abatements where, you know, question really is, do I have reasonable cause for why I didn't file or why I didn't pay my taxes? Those types of things, uh, there will be a big difference between, um, you know, prior to COVID-19 and after, because when you're trying to, when you get to deal with a human being, such as when you go to appeals, we'll talk about appeals. So after the first level at the IRS where they might say no to a penalty abatement, and that's just a, you know, a campus somewhere in Utah or in Memphis that you're uh, dealing with where they might just deny something, you always have the right to appeal it. And when you appeal it, you're gonna get a number of an individual who you're gonna speak to. I have found, most tax professionals have found that they are generally reasonable people. And here is where it gets into a gray area where you might be talking to a human being about understanding what your situation was, and he might be more likely uh, to, because of COVID-19, be able to resolve that matter. And when you talk about offers and compromise, sometimes, you know, there's really a question of, hey, this, I have a certain expense, but I have this expense due to a special needs child or something where it doesn't fit the actual box of the IRS rules, they might be more likely, the human being that you're dealing with might be more likely to be able to say yes because of the COVID-19 impacts and their understanding that people are struggling. So 
that's a, as a general rule. We're going to talk about the specifics. Certainly, when you talk about the currently non-collectible, that will have an impact just because people's income have gone down. In some ways, sometimes their expenses have gone up if their kids are home. Uh, there are certain things where you can call the IRS and say, based on my current income and expenses, I should be placed in currently non collectible. So let me just give a, a basic like idea of what's going on at the IRS and things do change by the day, but there is a lot of disparity within the IRS in terms of whether they are back up and running. There are still uh, pieces of mail that have been sitting at the IRS for months and have not been opened. I get calls from clients who sent a check to the IRS two months ago and they know it was received because they sent it certified, but it has not been cashed yet. That's not something that the IRS usually does. In fact, the IRS has recently started sending out checks to people and people are wondering like, what is this check? Is this another stimulus? Uh, no, it's actually just the interest on the amount of money that they paid the IRS uh, and the IRS never cashed the check, but the post date was three months ago. The IRS is issuing checks for a little bit of the interest. So correspondence by mail is definitely taking a lot longer at the IRS. So therefore penalty abatement requests that were sent in by mail will take a lot longer. Offers and compromise that were sent by mail and in general they are, unless you were dealing with a particular person at the IRS. Uh, it was sent by mail. A lot of those just have not been processed yet. So that just has an effect in terms of the time that it's taking uh, at the IRS. And I wanna talk about the statute uh, expiration date for a minute. Uh, and I realize that there is a lot of, um, you know, acronyms here on this, on this slide. The, the, um, the main thing that I want to talk about is something called the CSED, the CSED, which is the Collection Statute Expiration Date. Many people are familiar with the fact, with the ASED, the Assessment statute expiration date. Many people are familiar with the fact that the IRS only has three years to audit a return. Uh, once I file a return, the IRS has three years to come back to me and say, hey, I want to review that. I want to audit you. The collection statute expiration date is something that not a lot of people know about, but the rule is, is that if somebody files a return, he owes $100,000 and he hasn't paid it, he can't pay it. And 10 years go by from the time that return was filed, the person no longer owes that debt. The IRS will automatically write it off. Their computers will write it off. Sometimes, you know, a person, uh, you know, has to make sure that the IRS calculations were correct. Uh, but that's the, uh, the general idea. So if you file a return, 10 years is gonna, 10 years from then, the, the debt is going to go away, which is the reason why it's important if somebody makes a payment uh, to, usually if you make a payment and you owe for prior years, the IRS will automatically take that payment and apply it to your oldest year because they know it's going to expire sooner. So, as a general rule, if you have debt that's about to expire and you're making a payment, it's a good idea to make your payment to be applied to the later periods so they don't get lost in the black hole. There are certain things that toll or put a pause on the statute. That means that 10 year clock. So you wanna be careful if uh, it's coming close to those 10 years not to do something that's going to allow the IRS more time. And you think of it this way, the IRS has 10 years to collect on the debt 
on the taxes that are owed if you do something which does not enable the IRS to collect during that time period. Like when you file for an offer and compromise, that means you ask the IRS, please forgive my debt. So it takes a while, you know, somebody owed $100,000 and the, you know, the person taxpayer offers $50,000. As soon as you file for that offer and compromise, the IRS is not allowed to collect on the debt until they process the offer, which could take sometimes. And these days, you know, it's taking around a year for them to, to do that. I, I want to mention, in case I didn't mention before, in case I forget, uh, if the IRS, after two years of when they accept, two years after they receive your offer, if they haven't had a chance to process it yet, if they haven't specifically denied it, it's automatically deemed accepted after two years. Uh, that's something which is very rare to happen, although now after COVID-19, when they are going to have millions and millions of these sitting around, it might actually happen where, you know, they're gonna have to process things quicker, otherwise they might be you know, bumping up to the two years, which is deemed automatically accepted. There are uh, certain things which we're not going to get into, but if you file for a collection due process appeal, uh, that will also, uh, while that is going on and the IRS cannot collect, that those 10 years will be stopped. So in other words, I will, um, it'll be paused and then only when the IRS is able to collect again will that continue. And just so you know, uh, if I get into an installment agreement or I am in currently non-collectible, the 10 years does not stop. So that's an important thing to know. If somebody is in currently non-collectible, they might say, well, what do I gain if in another 10 year, another 20 years, the IRS is gonna to wanna to collect? The answer is no, because they only have 10 years. So currently non-collectible is a, a good status to be in because the 10 year clock keeps on running. Okay, I'm gonna delve a little bit into offers and compromise and uh, talk a little bit about the process, what goes on at the IRS. I would say the most frequent question I get asked in regards to an offer and compromise is because people hear all these ads about pennies on the dollar. They say, they call me and they say, okay, I owe $100,000. How much will the IRS accept? It's not a matter of haggling and a certain percentage. Rather, it's knowing the rules and it's based on one thing. It's based on your reasonable collection potential, which we're gonna talk about in a minute, but before you even get started with an offer and compromise, what uh, I also get sometimes as often as the first question is, I haven't filed returns in seven years can I get an offer and compromise on that? The answer is an offer and compromise only works on a tax that was assessed, which means on a return that was filed. If a return was not filed, the 10 year clock does not start. And the, um, I can't get an offer and compromise. So in order to think about to get in the game of making an offer and compromise, I have to have filed all my taxes and I have to have paid my estimated taxes. Uh, for those that are not familiar with estimated taxes, though, that is those people that are, have their own businesses, they are, instead of having taxes withheld from a paycheck because they're not getting a paycheck, they are supposed to make quarterly uh, estimated tax payments. So many offers are returned because somebody hasn't filed their last year return or they haven't made their estimated taxes. Uh, you want to make sure that you are compliant with filing uh, and paying your estimated taxes. That's for the current year. 
because if you don't, they will just take your offer and send it right back and I don't even have a right to appeal. So sometimes an offer and compromise will only uh, work if you don't have like a 100% great, you know, offer and compromise where you have nothing and you owe a lot. Uh, sometimes you might need to talk to a human being and go to appeals to be able to discuss that, especially during this, uh, this time. It's important that you're compliant and your return, your uh, offering compromise doesn't get returned. If it gets rejected, you always have the right to appeal it. Okay. We're going to talk a little bit about reasonable collection potential. I don't want to get too much into it, but just so you have a basic idea to know where to go. And I put here on the slide a link to a pre-qualifier. The IRS has a tool on their website in which they, uh, you just, you could either click on that or, you know, search for uh, IRS OIC pre-qualifier tool. And it's going to ask you questions how much tax do you owe, and what are, what are your income, expenses, and assets, and it'll spit out, it'll tell you whether you're gonna be in the ballpark for an offer and compromise. So it's a really good tool, uh, and I, would, I recommend for everybody to use that for people that wanna know if they're in the ballpark for getting an offer and compromise. But the bottom line is, it's really not a matter of a percentage of the debt that you owe. Because everybody, when they call me, they first say, oh, I don't have any money. I don't have any assets. I don't have any. Uh, um, they, what, they, what you want to do is check what is the equity in assets. So in other words, you think about it. If somebody owns a home, if they, uh, the home is worth a million dollars, well, if they owe a million dollars on it, on the house, then they don't have equity of anything. So that's not considered uh, a realizable equity in your assets. So that's not something that will count against you. But if somebody has a $2 million home and owes $200,000 on it, they have 1.8 million in equity. Now the IRS automatically gives you like discounts, assuming quick sale. That's where you talk more about the science and figuring out uh, how to process uh, the offer the, in, in the details. But the bottom line is if somebody has, is, is somebody is sitting on two million, two million dollars of equity in their house uh, and they owe a hundred thousand dollars in taxes and they just want a deal, the IRS is going to say, well, you have equity there in that house. Why don't you use that? So there might be answers to that. I can't borrow against it. They won't let by you know the bank. I have a letters from a bank saying they won't give me a loan because of my uh, tax liens, uh, or you know I don't have any income, so they won't give me whatever it is. There are answers, but you're basically they're going to look for what do you have if they were to uh, if you were to sell those assets today plus the monthly disposable income. Now you might be laughing because who has monthly disposable income? They uh, have a criteria and we're gonna take a look at that to see, um, this is a, a page taken out from an old offer and compromise uh, form. Uh, the current form is the current form is a little bit different, but it's, you know, it's got the same idea in which you're going to have a list of, and this is all really done for you in that pre-qualifier tool. But this is basically just so you understand the back end, what is happening is there's going to be a list of your uh, wages, of your income on the left side, and then there's going to be a list of your actual expenses on the other side. You might notice something where it says IRS use only allowable expenses. Uh, if you want to know, those are actually published on the IRS website. You can go to something called IRS collection standards and due to their 
uh, extreme wisdom. Uh, Congress has given the IRS uh, the ability to determine exactly how much money you should be spending based on your family size and the region that you live. And basically what it's going to come down to here, if you have your expenses, your allowable expenses, that if your allowable expenses exceed your income, then uh, your monthly disposable income is going to be zero. If your income exceeds your, your monthly income exceeds your monthly allowable expenses, then uh, you'll have something at the end of each month to be able to pay towards your debt. And you'll notice, uh, this is kind of complicated, but you'll notice it's pretty simple. In box F, it'll say, what's your remaining monthly income? And then you'll multiply it Let's take the easy example. You multiply it by, by 12 uh, and your future remaining income, in other words, they're gonna say, okay, within the next year, you're gonna have a certain amount available to pay per month. That plus your equity in assets is your offer amount. So if you wanna know if you're in the ballpark of, your, of uh, doing an offer and compromise, that's really, uh, it takes, you know, if somebody asks, will the IRS accept an offer and compromise? What is the percentage? You really have to find out what their assets are, what their equity and assets are, and what their income and expenses. You know, shouldn't take more than five, 10 minutes to go through that pre-qualifier tool, but that's pretty much what it is. Um, you know, there are differences in terms of what is considered an allowable expense, what isn't. That's where our industry, you know, um, you know, um, it depends on knowing the law and knowing how to apply it and being able to negotiate. That's a little bit where the art also comes in, in terms of being able to speak to a human being and explain that this circumstance, maybe he should be allowed, uh, you know, more of an expense for this uh, for for the the offer and compromise. So that's pretty much the story with the offer and compromise and the way uh, I see the difference. I will tell you from my experience uh, in dealing with the IRS within the last month or two. You know, there are many people at the IRS that have been that been working remotely even before COVID-19. Those are pretty much working regular. But even those and the ones who have, you know, are back to the campus, the appeals officers, they are more gentler. They are more reasonable and recognizing that people are struggling. So if there is a judgment call uh, circumstance, uh, there there certainly is opportunity and the fact that the IRS knows that there is reason uh, for the, uh, this uh, financial struggle, uh, I believe there is more of an opportunity to be able to get into an offer and compromise uh, given the, the current situation. Now might actually be a good time to uh, file for an offer and compromise if a person is in that situation because they're gonna look at your income and assets the way they are now on your date of application. So just dealing quickly with some collection matters before we uh, stop for some questions. You might've heard about a uh, program that the government has where they uh, are revoking passports for people that owe more than 50,000. Now it's a little bit more than that. It's more like 52, 53,000. Uh, but if people owe more than that, the government has been certifying those people to the State Department that they have a delinquent, a large delinquent tax debt, and the government can actually revoke their passport. So a person would want to not like everybody, anybody's traveling now anyway, but it's good for a person to be able to uh, have that freedom. And if you ask for an offer and compromise or installment agreement or even currently non-collectible status, 
they will give you back your passport. So they just want people to not be ignoring them at the IRS. The uh, certain states, like if you're in New York State, uh, they have uh, been suspending driver's licenses for people that owe more than $10,000 to New York State. Different states have certain rules like that. Those also, uh, you know, have gotten people to pay attention. So there are options there also. You do an offer and compromise with the state. As soon as you ask for an offer, as soon as you file for an offer and compromise, even though it takes New York State a year to process, uh, they will give you back your license. If you're in an installment agreement, they will also give you back your license. Um, private debt collectors is something which many people get are uh, freaked out when they get notices from a private debt collector, um, you know, saying we were told by the IRS. So I just want to differentiate. There's a difference between scam letters that you get from tax resolution firms uh, threatening something. If it's not from the IRS, if you didn't receive something from the IRS or one of these particular private debt collectors, um, you should just know the private debt collectors have no collection authority, which means they have no ability, they have no enforcement authority. They have no ability to place a lien or a levy garnish your wages or anything like that. So all they can do is take payment or arrange an installment agreement. So you really don't have to worry uh, so much about them uh, enforcing the debt. Let's talk about penalty abatements just for a few minutes, which is there are, uh, you know, I have found in my experience, if somebody has a nonprofit organization that, let's say, filed their uh, tax return late. There are large penalties. Those are much easier to get abated than for-profit companies. And that's just uh, not in relation to the specific rules, because the reasonable cause is really the same. But that's really the human aspect, which is that uh, as a uh, you know, the person that's going to look at it, he sees that this is a charity, an organization or something like that, uh, they are more likely to be able to forgive that. A good thing to know about is something called a first time abatement, where if somebody filed, uh, got a penalty for filing a tax return late or paying uh, late, there is a way, and they don't do it on their own, even though they should. The IRS doesn't do it on their own. You have to call or write to them. It's easier to call. You call the IRS and you say, um, hey, this is the first time I was late. I got a penalty. Can you please uh, waive the penalty? It's called first time abatement. And they will look and they will see uh, there are certain criteria. But as a general rule, if you haven't um, had a penalty on your account for the prior three years, they will say, all right, you know, we'll waive it this time, try better next time. That's basically the idea. Uh, as a general rule, I have found that with the IRS, and very often I get calls from people saying, do you know somebody at the IRS you've been dealing with people? You know, can you get somebody there that will waive the penalty? As a general rule, the IRS does not have that. Sometimes the states or the cities, uh, they do. You know, it depends uh, if you have a contact there that you could reach out to. It's more like the Wild West when you talk about the states or, or, or cities uh, to be able to uh, get penalty abatement. Uh, but at the IRS, it's really, they have certain criteria. Uh, and if you don't qualify for first time abatement, there is something called reasonable cause, which is what every tax entity uses in terms of deciding whether to abate penalties. And nine times out of 10, when I have a client calling me or a prospective client calling me with a penalty that they got, and I'll say, so could you give me the reason as to why you filed late? And there's usually a pause and they'll say, well, you tell me, well, why, what reason should I have? And, uh, you know, reasonable cause is something where 
it really depends on the facts. And there are certain things that just, you know, somebody that works in this industry knows what the IRS accepts, but they are basically going to want to see that there was an event that happened. It's not like this guy does this all the time. There was a particular event that happened and therefore they couldn't file. So their records were destroyed. Their accountant, you know, uh, made a mistake or they had a switched accountants and they couldn't get the records or Hurricane Sandy came and washed away years of records. Something like that. If you, you know, the IRS is going to want to see um, you know, when did the event happen? Did the person get sick? He was in the hospital. So, you know, they want to know when, when did he get sick? Uh, when was the return due? When was the return filed? In other words, does the story make sense? And do you have that documentation? That's the general idea. You know, obviously that's where some, a little bit of the art uh, comes in, in being able to create the story and the picture with documents and with uh, arguing, explaining exactly what the reason was. I believe in this realm, COVID-19 is gonna make a big difference. Uh, for years after Hurricane Sandy, uh, Hurricane Sandy was used very often to get penalty abatements for, you know, uh, not being able for late filing penalties, late payment penalties, uh, because certain records were not available. I believe due, due to COVID-19, there are going to be many, many penalty abatement requests and penalty abatements granted uh, because of this. And it's really just a matter of explaining the story, explaining exactly why that was, uh, why that happened. Thank you so very much for joining us. I'm wondering if there were any questions, let's see, uh, that came up during the thing to see if I uh, can. Uh, let's see if I could look at the questions here. Okay. Um, okay, some great questions here. So let's see. Um, how long does a mail-in amendment take with the IRS? Now, uh, during COVID-19, uh, it's been taking months. Like, I have not seen a mail-in amended return be processed yet, even ones that were sent in four months ago. So even regular paper returns that are now at least being processed. Some of the checks haven't been, um, you know, cashed yet. So definitely taking a while. That's going to, anything that you could do uh, electronically, certain, certainly do electronically. And if you're doing anything by paper, just make sure you send it certified and keep your tracking uh, information. Is the 10 year rule only for taxes? or does that include penalties and interest as well? Great question. The answer is it includes everything, penalties and interest as well. So in other words, it will be totally wiped away. That's the 10-year the, uh, rule. That includes everything. And by the way, offer and compromise also um, includes penalties and interest. It's the taxes, penalties, and the interest. It totally wipes it away. So, you know, I had somebody that had over a million dollars of a tax debt. The IRS accepted $500 to wipe that away. Now, that is because we showed that he didn't have the assets and didn't have the income to be able to pay it. So that's really, that was just a matter of showing that to the IRS. So it's not a matter of a percentage. Um, but uh, that's really a matter of just applying the, the math and their rules. Okay, offering compromise restrictions seem pretty tight in terms of allowable equity and assets. If you can't have any assets at all, how can the person afford to pay even the reduced amount? That's also, seems like a catch 22. That's also a great question. The answer is, um, it's not as uh, strict because there are certain allowable uh, assets that you are, you're allowed to have a certain amount of cash, you're allowed to have a certain amount for your living expenses, and if a person is no longer working, then he could show, I have this amount of money that I'm going to need to be able to live on. 
So those things are valid arguments. A person is allowed to have uh, assets. Uh, a person is allowed to have a home, but he's not allowed to have a uh, $5 million mansion and you know, claim poverty and want the IRS to just forgive his debt. So I think it's really just a matter of, um, I think, uh, you know, it happens to be different states, like New York State, for example, is a lot more strict with the assets uh, when you talk about orphans and compromise in the IRS. The IRS, I have found, is a lot more lenient uh, in terms of being able to value assets, because the bottom line is the IRS doesn't want your house. Uh, they're not interested in it. They're interested in getting as much money as they can. So the person processing that uh, I have found is kind of lenient. New York State, um, especially if a person owes more than 100000 in taxes, it has to get approval from a uh, New York State Supreme Court judge. Uh, they have very particular if the person owns any real estate. Um, so can you get a million dollar New York State bill compromised to $500? That's a great question. Uh, the answer is it's extremely rare. I did, I did. Uh, this same person owed New York State also. Uh, they did not accept 500, but the IRS, ex I mean, New York State accepted 5,000 uh, in terms of that bill. As a general rule, New York State wants you to pay the tax. Even in an offering compromise, they will uh, waive the penalties and interest, which is a lot in New York State, but as a general rule, they're gonna want the tax, unless it's an extreme hardship situation, which sometimes you can show. If it's an extreme hardship situation, you can, but as a general rule, their first uh, answer, with New York State, it's gonna be a lot of haggling. You know, They're gonna come back and say, your offer is too low. You know, can you increase it more? And then they'll come back and say, okay, we can do that. We, you know, so that's the, the way it works. Um, there. Uh, another good question. How does private school tuition play into the expense equation? Also, fantastic question. The answer is it does not. Unfortunately, the IRS uh, does not allow for private school tuition. So that's, I mean, you could pay private school tuition. They're not going to stop you from that, but they're not going to consider that an allowable expense and say, okay, therefore we understand you have to pay your uh, private school uh, tuition and therefore you can't pay your taxes. Uh, that's not considered an allowable expense. Okay, thank you so very much for your time. And if there are any comments and questions that I didn't get to, please feel free to email it and uh, hopefully we will get to it. And uh, May you have a wonderful, blessed day. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for coming.